In this video, we're going to be going over some of the saddest quests in World of Warcraft. These quests made this list for what the quests made you do, or what happened to the NPCs during or after said quests. And at number 10, we have Until Death Do Us Part. This is a really melancholy quest provided by an undead NPC named Clarence Foster in Thunderbluff. In the quest, she rants to you about how her husband, Yurif, left to go and fight the Scourge with the Crusade and never cared about her or their children. So she gives you a necklace, presumably given to her by her husband, to place on his grave in the Silver Pine Forest to get rid of it. Upon getting to the tomb of her husband, it states, The stone is cold to the touch, but has obviously been abused. Trash litters the area, nicks and gashes decorate the relief atop the coffin, and the foliage around the grave has started to grow over the site. No one cares for whoever is buried here, especially not any victims of the plague. Although, upon approaching and inspecting the grave, you are met with this text. The word betrayer is crudely scratched over the finely etched epitaph that reads, Yuriv lives here, father, husband, paladin. Let his children bear witness to the fact that his dedication to the light was unquestionable. He would never ask anything of them that he himself would not do. And then, once the necklace is placed on it, it says, You place the worthless pendant on the grave, and the gemstone within this setting seems to dull noticeably. As you stand to leave, you look down at the pendant. It lies lifelessly over the hands of the relief sculpted onto the top of the coffin. Your thoughts are interrupted by a stiff, cool breeze passing over the sepular. For a moment, everything around you is silent. And the quest is then completed. Very similar to other quests in the game with happier endings, this quest, on the other hand, doesn't have anything that could be considered as a happy ending, as Yurev died trying to protect his family from the Scourge, which they ultimately fell to themselves. Clarence is so angry at the fact that her husband never cared about her as much as he did in trying to protect them, and you realize that Yurev has been dead for such a long time that he will be forever forgotten, when all he did was try to protect his family. Although, the fact that someone scratched Betrayer into the stone seems to imply something more is at play, as it is doubtful Clarence would have done this, otherwise she would have left the necklace herself. If so, who was it, and why did someone see him as a betrayer? And at number 9, we have Welcome to the Machine. Welcome to the Machine is a rather unique quest that you get in the Hillsbrad Foothills. It gives you a lot of easter eggs and funny references throughout the entire chain, with one noticeable NPC named Kingslayer Orcus. When you first meet him, he has the same attitude as a lot of players do today, full of himself and thinking he's better than everyone else while refusing any real challenges. Later on in the quest chain, you find him drowning and have to save him, where you learn that he was tossed into relatively shallow water because he overheard that there was going to be a meeting at Pergishan Isle, with Vandar Stormpike, Belinda Stonehearth, and Ivar Bloodfang, with the Vandar just throwing him into the ocean as he tried to attack them. Once he's composed himself and treats the wounds on his dragon, Kasha, you join Orcus by flying over to Pergishan Isle to fight their way to Vandar, Belinda, and Ivar. But this changes once Orcus notices there's Alliance battle plans near them, and it gives a quest where he distracts them for you to grab the plans with Kasha. Even though he was the typical WoW elitist, very pompous and full of himself when you first met him, he tosses that aside and dives straight into combat, and tries to buy the player as much time as possible, but gets mortally wounded in the fight as you're flying away on his dragon. Kasha comes back and grabs him as you're both flying to Terran Mill. He tells you that he wishes for Kasha to have a new home, somewhere cold before he dies. High Warlord Chromosh gets the battle plans and honors Orcus as a hero of the Horde, and Orcus's sacrifice is what paved the way for the elimination of the Stormpike clan in the Hillsbrad foothills. After this quest, if you're a ghost, you can still see his spirit riding Kasha around Terran Mill as a remembrance to a fondly looked on character in the game. And at number 8, we have Lakeshire's Last Stand. This is a quest for the Kyrian Covenant in the quest chain called Trial of Ascension, starting with the quest called A Day in the Life. In this quest, you have to witness the final moments of Ben Howell, another soul who died and has to be judged and moved on to the realms in the Shadowlands. While requiring you to do basic menial stuff, like hunt or deliver things, very soon Red Ridge Mountains becomes attacked by the Scourge. And now it's obvious that none of the citizens are going to survive the attack. So you're tasked with boarding up the windows around Lakeshire, saving as many civilians as you can by warning them, and then running back to your home and warning your family. As Ben gets back to his family and warns them, ghouls immediately start attacking, and while he does his best to prevent them from reaching his family, he ultimately dies. Being ripped apart by the Scourge is a rough death for a simple farmer like Ben was, and when you confront his spirit, he cries about how he couldn't protect his family. And while he was comforted by the Kyrian and everyone agreed he was deemed worthy of Bastion, as the Arbiter is offline, he is instead sent to the Maw, 
a moment which breaks the NPC quest giver who's with you as she realizes the scope of the horrible system that is the Shadowlands in its current state. Today, you can go back to that location and see his wife and children still there and alive, as it seems, thankfully, his noble sacrifice was enough to save his family. And at number 7, we have Devastation. This is a quest chain located in the Badlands which starts with Dolph Blasses, with the quest easily swayed, having you deal with some ogres and then delivering a strange package to Rhea. You then work on collecting various black dragon eggs, and after dealing with the various black dragons in the area, it is then revealed her name is Restraza, a red dragon here to perform research into ways of purifying the black dragon flight. She then has the player do a bunch of tasks that result in her eventually having them capture one of the dragons named Nixandria, and then forcing her to lay eggs for Rhea to experiment on. And while she says she feels remorse for doing this, she does it for the belief of the greater good. You are then sent around the zone to gather readings on the black dragon eggs and eventually create a purified black dragon egg using a titan artifact. Rhea then has to constantly move around to avoid being caught by the agents of the black dragon who want to kill her in the egg. Meanwhile, we are sent to help some lost vikings deal with threats within the area before eventually having to kill Nyakstra and her brood driven insane by the fury of so much black dragon death. And with the help of the vikings, the black dragon flight are finally out of the area and Riastraza tries to move the purified black dragonflight egg she hid once more, this time inside of a cave. As she drops her notes by the cave entrance and walks to the back of the cave to the egg to finally get out of the Badlands and bring it safely, she speaks to it as a mother would to a young baby. But unfortunately, Deathwing finds out where she is and swoops in and kills her. Before Deathwing incinerates them, she asks him for mercy on the egg, her only accomplishment, before Deathwing says no and kills everything and then flies away. When you go and inspect the area, her notes are still intact, and upon reading them, it says, Heroes, if you're reading this, then my suspicions were correct. Deathwing has found us. The egg is destroyed, as am I. This was, actually, the plan from the beginning. You see, the egg that Deathwing destroyed was not the egg he sought. It was mine. And upon completion of the quest, the player is awarded with a unique trinket called Rhea's Last Egg, with a flavor text that says, Please take care of him for me. And when used, it summons a red dragon whelpling to defend you, as it seems while she died, thankfully her child did not. And as for the real egg, the purified black dragon egg that was hidden from Deathwing is very important, as the egg eventually hatched to be Rathion, who even though purified, is nothing close to a pure person, being right out a horrible person overall, which because of him being the offspring of Nyaxtria, who is not one of Deathwing's consorts, proves that he is not actually the son of Deathwing, like he claims, but is instead the grandson of Deathwing, as he even calls Onyxia, who is actually an offspring of Deathwing auntie. Although as egotistical as he is, it is totally understandable why he would upplay his connection to the Destroyer. And at number 6, we have Runus the Shamed. With this being a quest in the storyline of Azuna, Stella Gosa tasks you with killing the NPC called Runus the Shamed, who was seen feasting on dragon whelps to feed his mana addiction. Upon attempting to do so, he goes into an obscene rage about ripping out your heart and drinking the mana from your bones before he then surrenders. Something not commonly seen in WoW, as apparently before becoming withdrawn from magic, he was quite the sophisticated man. And so you're instead tasked with escorting him back to Senegosa, who doesn't like him in the slightest as he's a nightfallen who succumbed to mana addiction and warns you of the inevitable betrayal. But since Runus is useful, you are now tasked with spending time with him doing various things around the map followed up with his often prettiest humorous dialogues. Bunch of mana addicts, that lot. <laughs> Not me, though. My discipline is iron. Oh, mana crystal, just a moment. As the quest chain continues, you're eventually separated, and you're told that Nightfallen have entered a cave nearby, and you're asked to investigate it. When you go inside, the only Nightfallen is Runus, kneeling in a pool slowly becoming withered from mana withdrawal. His memory is fading and it's more difficult for him to do things, but he tells you that he tried to warn you that there's danger close by, but was too late before his addiction started to take hold. As he's slowly slipping into becoming a withered, and as he's scratching, shivering, and twitching, he says, Is that you, my friend? This hunger is consuming my very mind. It is taking every ounce of my energy to just... to... just... Can you hear me, my friend? I, I, I cannot see you anymore. I think perhaps it is time to say goodbye then. Thank you, my friend, 
for letting my last few hours mean something. Before he kneels over and becomes a withered, beginning to mindlessly wander the cavern, likely to be killed by the dragons that reside within, with no chance to save him, as the Arkandor cure would not be found for far, far long after. However, we still have one token left of him, a coin that can be fished up in the Dalaran Fountain, Runus's last copper. With the flavor text reading, I wish I had some mana right now. Now, now, now. A depressing story about the loss of life to addiction. And at number five, we have For Love Eternal. In the old version of a zone called Darkshore, there's a night elf named Cerulean Whiteclaw that's standing by the edge of the pier, crying. When speaking to him, he tells you about how in the aftermath of the Well of Eternity fight, Amantha Aran was destroyed and everyone there died, including his wife, Anaya. His wife's death has haunted him for thousands of years, and he still has nightmares about it after all this time. When he was wandering the woods of Darkshore one day in a stupor, he found himself in Amantha Aran, and saw his wife's haunted spirit and asked you to kill the spirit and free her so she can rest, as he cannot do it himself. Upon killing her spirit, you're given Anaya's pendant, and when returning to Cerulean, he thanks you and says he couldn't do it himself because even after his wife had died, he couldn't bring himself to harm her and rewards you with an item called Tear of Grief. Shortly after, a small cutscene of sort plays, where Anaya's spirit appears in front of Cerulean, with Cerulean saying, Anaya, do my eyes deceive me? Is it really you? As she responds, the ages have been cruel to you and I, my love, but be assured, it is, and at long last we are reunited. After some more dialogue between them, she thanks him for freeing her spirit and lets him know she loves him, but she has to leave. In response, Cerulean begs her to stay. She eventually fades away with a special text, reading, Anya's soft voice trails away into the mist. Know that I love you always as Cerulean breaks down crying because he doesn't have the strength to face the world without her. As a side note, the item he gives you actually reduces your spirit by minus three, which I guess is a reference to his soul being shattered from the loss of his wife. And at number four, we have a flicker of hope. This was a unique questline that was added as a pre-launch event for Battle for Azeroth, and because of this is no longer accessible at all. Through a very long quest chain with the Horde pushing their way into Darkshore, while the few Night Elf and Worgen forces do their best to hold them off, it nearly finishes as Sylvanas attacks Darnassus and sets it aflame. As a member of the Alliance, you're left with a giant bonfire as the flames close in upon you and the countless civilians, man, woman, and child within the World Tree, you're tasked with evacuating as many Night Elf citizens as possible. But with the flames quickly closing in, you only have three minutes to do so. As thousands of Night Elves are running around in fear, it's obvious that it was impossible to evacuate everyone, and you only have a few remaining resources to be able to even attempt to fight the fires. With the Night Elves running around saying random quotes, like not being able to breathe, or saying to help others and leave them, having no choice but to save the most Night Elves, Ancient Protectors and Sentinels burn to death, especially those in Dalinar and Shadow Glen, as there isn't even a way to reach them. Most notable is saving a child called Ishala, Belastra Starbreeze's child, with her yelling out, Ishala, Ishala, are you out there? Please, Ishala, listen to my voice, along with other things, as it's actually possible to not be able to save her child or herself, along with the puppy that I know you missed. And the priestess holding open portals trying to rescue as many as possible, ultimately sacrificing themselves to get people out. Once the three minute timer ends, your character passes out and awakens at a temple with Gen and Mia Grainmane. Mia nearly giving her life to try and save a child that was to be named Finnel, the last, as she was the last Keldari to escape the burning of Teldrassil, with many left behind, including Ashtari and her priestess who willingly stay in order to pray to her goddess to save as many as she can, leaving her and her people to suffocate, burn, and suffer within the flames. There's been very few impossible quests added to the game, and none of them have had this much of an impact on the player base as this one has, especially with the loss of an entire faction hub. All of this made so much more painful as we arrive within the Shadowlands to find many of these souls tormented constantly within the Maw, even in death screaming for someone to save them, as their goddess Alune, who could have saved them, instead sent them to the Shadowlands to assist her sister the Winter Queen in Ardenwald, unknowingly damning these poor souls to the Maw itself. And at number 3, we have Moss Walker Savior. A quest located in the Sholzar Basin, this is given to you by an NPC named Gorlock Moodle. Moodle asks you to go save the Mosswalker victims who've been taken captive by the undead in the area. When going after the undead, the Mosswalker victims are being dragged along the floor with chains, and it's actually possible to not actually save any of them. See, this quest has an RNG factor of sorts, 
as each time you free them, it is randomly chosen if they are able to be saved or not, with the quest to have a unique dialogue for whether or not you're able to. In their dying breaths, they say, Please take my shinies. All done. We not do anything to them. I no understand. Use my shinies. Make weather good again. Make undead things go away. We give shinies to shrine. We not greedy. Why this happen? I do something bad? I sorry. Before breathing their sadly but hopefully last breaths, as the Gorlocks don't really understand what's going on or why they're even being attacked, since they were a peaceful village and just kept to themselves before the Scourge came, even blaming themselves thinking the Scourge attack is somehow their own fault. Although luckily, they do say some good lighthearted things that will break up the absolute despair of death, if they survive. We saved, you nice dry skin. Maybe you make weather better too? You save us, yay for you. Thank you, you good. And thankfully, the quest ends off with, it's a small comfort to see they haven't brought any back in on death. So at least the Gorlocks have found peace in death and are not being turned into horrible abominations of undeath. And at number two, we have the original quest chain, Pamela Redpath. This quest was given to you by Pamela's dead aunt, Marlene, who tells you that many people died in a battle that happened there and asks you to go to Daroshar and find her niece. Upon finding her in a burnt down home, she tells you that she's been waiting for a long time for her dad to return as he had to leave to fight but never came back. She tells you that bad people whisper to her and she wants her dad to make them go away, but she doesn't know where he is and asks you to go find her doll as comfort. After doing so, Pamela tells you how lonely she is because her family never returned and asks you to find her aunt, Marlene. After some more quests, you find out that Pamela's father, Joseph, had his soul twisted by the scourge and became the undead. But Chromie tells you there's a way to change Joseph's fate. Through a semi-long quest chain, you gather all the materials needed to give them to Chromie, who then tasks you with placing them in the center of Daroshire and holding out for as long as you can through a very long fight, and killing the corrupted spirits as they arrive to change their fate. Once completed, you successfully save Joseph's spirit from being corrupted, and Pamela rejoices by saying that she heard her dad whisper to her and says he's going to scare all the ghosts away and he's finally coming home where Pamela presents you with the tea and sugar and gives you a key to unlock a chest containing some loot. After a few minutes, Joseph will walk up to the house where he asks if Pamela is home. She is excited to see him again and has all these ideas to spend time with him before saying how much she missed him, in which he responds by saying he missed her too, only for both of them to fade out shortly after, as all ghosts do once they've been freed. This is all the more sad knowing you can find Pamela, her dad, and her aunt and uncle, happy, healthy, and alive within the Colin of Stratholme instance long before their deaths. And at number one, we have a Tale of Valor. This is a quest offered in Ice Crown by High Lord Tyrion Fordrin, who tasks you with locating a hero named Crusader Brydenbrand at the Silent Vigil. Tyrion tells you how Brydenbrand was one of the many people wounded in the fight against the Scourge, and he alone dragged more than a dozen people to safety, one by one through all the fighting, but he has not been seen since. After finding him in the mountains near a campfire, you find out that he has the Plague of Undeath, but he chose to stay in the mountains to avoid spreading it to anyone else. This unique quest chain involves going to major leaders, like Keeper Remulus, Alex Straza, and Adal, and seeking a way to cure Bryden Brand of his affliction, but unfortunately none of them are able to cure him of his illness. Adal and all of his Naru redeem Bryden Brand's soul when he dies to prevent them from being raised as a scourge, and promises him paradise forever. When you return to Bride and Bran, all three Naru show up and release his spirit, while Adal says, Fear not, young one, for this crusader shall not taste death. In life, Bride and Bran was the bearer of great deeds. Now in passing, he shall taste only paradise. The light does not abandon its champions. Which now leaves the player with returning Bride and Bran's possessions to Tyrion. Tyrion thanks you and says he knew he died because he felt the light to leave the land, and thanks you for your selflessness in attempting to save Bride and Bran, with each armor piece offered as a reward from this chain having unique names in memory of him. It turns out that this quest was based off of a real person, Bradford C. Breidenbecker, the brother of Robert Breidenbecker, who was Blizzard's former executive producer and vice president of Classic Games. Bradford was also an active player in World of Warcraft, and so Robert sent the WoW team an email requesting a character to be created in tribute, to which Chris Metzen worked on creating the questline in tribute to him himself. And with that, that's it for the video. WoW is full of amazing stories of sadness and despair, a thing that is often quite difficult to pull off, but when it does land well, it touches the hearts of those who experience them. These stories can give a hope to the sadness we experience every day in our lives, and as such are one of the times Blizzard shows their best storytelling, especially when these quests are dedicated to the lives of real people, 
immortalizing them for countless people to experience. 